Okay, so um, it's obviously a changing landscape for augmented reality, as we know. Um, for me, um, my rethinking of all of it started in 2006 when I started thinking about the implications for language because I read Rainbow's End. You've all read Rainbow's End, right? If you haven't, uh, that's your homework assignment. Um, and Werner Vinge just says it's the canonical 25 years in the future. Everybody's got the contact lenses. Kids grew up in a world where they've always put them in. They don't think about it anymore. Now what? So the nice thing is he's not thinking about how we do it. He's thinking about what happens after everybody takes it for granted. Um, so we have enough, you know, there's the ODG, there's the HoloLens. As we know, they're limited right now because there's a 30 degree field of view. There is actually very exciting is that, of course, there's the meta, which has a wider field of view so far. It's still kind of bulky and it's tethered, but we will get to the point sometime probably in the next you know, five years where um, things are gonna get better. Somebody or other is gonna come up with some approximation to you know, the glasses. And the glasses are gonna probably have a little like 6K by 6K micro display you know, like in each year. There's gonna be a light pipe. There's gonna send information around. And we're just gonna not think about it. They'll become socially invisible, just the way glasses now have become socially invisible. You can't actually remember who around you is wearing glasses unless you actually turn to look at them. And at that point, as everybody here knows, the, uh, comp everything that we want to compute will just be out here. And I think of it as it'll be the beginning of the age of computer graphics. So that means that we will take for granted, just as we now look at the text on a menu, and we don't think, wow, that's weird, strange scribbles, and yet you and I can understand it. We take for granted the technology of the written word and that we can talk to someone who's thousands of miles away, which would have freaked out anybody in Jane Austen's time. Um, and, but we don't even think about it because, as Alan Kay said, technology is ever, anything that was invented after you were born. So, not only will we accept that these virtual objects are there because we'll all see them from a correct point of view, but content will start changing. We'll start creating interesting creatures that we will think of as being in the world around us, and there'll be entire new industries that don't exist yet because consumers will say, oh, I want to interact with this. I want this part of my life. We don't even know what that's going to be like yet, but it's very exciting. Um, but to me, more fundamental than that is that when kids start growing up in a world where I do this, um, and stuff happens, they will start thinking about language differently because kids invent language. You put a bunch of kids together in a room and um, they will start evolving the way they talk to each other. And in fact, all language evolution comes from children under seven years old because their brains are wired that way. Um, that means that eventually they're gonna start assuming I do this, this happens, I do this happens. You know that because we're part of the same community of children. And they're going to end up in a world that to us seems magical, but to them they take for granted a kind of a world that I think of as um, Harry Potter meets Harold and the Purple Crayon. And it's like everyone here is, ooh, and kids like 20 years from now say, I don't understand why that's a big deal. So um, I've been interested in trying to understand as this stuff happens, um, what will this language be like? What will be the elements of this language? So I've been playing around and working with some of my students at NYU to say, what happens if we draw in the air and you just start thinking it's 20 years in the future and I'm just drawing this in the air in front of me, um, but anything I draw is part of a language. Um, anything I draw could come to life. So for example, that's an object, and of course, because it's an object, and as Bert Sutherland taught us in 1966, um, objects can form languages, visual languages. And so, so what happens if this becomes conversational and performative? Not, oh, I'm going to sketch up and building something, but you and I are having a conversation. In the middle of our conversation, all this stuff is happening. So for me, it's really exciting, because right now, um, if I want to teach computer graphics, um, and I, uh, that's mainly what I teach at NYU, I, ha I can't really engage people conversationally. But what if there's some specific, like, you know, one of my procedural textures, I want to just bring that up um, and, and say, oh, and I want to have, go you know, right in between us, I want to talk about the code. You know, this, this is fragment shader code that's running, like, you know, I'm changing it. Um, and then they can sort of see the connection between, you know, the depth of the computer graphics and the stuff that you could do with it. Um, and to me, what's exciting about, about this in particular, I mean, these things are great. I mean, I love these things. I have my new Pixel phone. It's all very exciting. But the problem with this is that you have to socially signal even to look at it. And I don't want to have to socially signal. I want to just like be talking to you directly. So for example, let's just say uh, for the sake of argument that um, 
I want to talk about. I'm now I was inspired by Steve Mann's demo, which I thought was just absolutely wonderful. So now I'm going to go back to one of his ideas, which is the light bulb. You know, and what is a light bulb? A light bulb is a transducer that changes um, electricity to um, to light. But what he said is light bulb is also part, and he pointed out it's part of the Internet of Things. So suppose I want to describe semantically in a conversation with you visually um, how I want to control that light bulb. So let's, let's take Steve Mann's camera, and we put the camera here, and we say the camera is looking at the light bulb, and we want to describe an interaction. So, um, so this is, um, actually I confess, this is the only part of my talk that actually involves hand waving. Um, I'm going to wave this in front of here. And what just happened there? What happened there is I described a process whereby you can imagine, say, for some eco-friendly way, I want to say, when someone passes into the room, you turn the light on or out, out of the light. But I was able to do it as part of a conversational engagement with you. And in fact, underneath all of this, this is all just running in HTML5. This is all just JavaScript. Um, the code is very simple. That's the object of the, of the camera. Everything, as, as is standard these days, is live coding. So you know, I can start um, you know, making changes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think it's important that we give this sort of conversational, not just interaction between people, but be able to open up the box, change things in the middle of the conversation, and just keep going with what we're doing. Um, and so for example, um, let's, let's talk about this internet of things. I think we're going to change fundamentally the way we are thinking about our relationship with the physical world. Because after all, the progress of technology is generally the progress from, oh, I have to go off there and do it beforehand, to, no, you and I are doing this conversationally. Right now, if you want to manufacture or design physical objects, you kind of have to do it in front of a computer screen. I just drew the symbol for um, a surface of revolution or making something on a lathe. So now in real time, during imagine I'm drawing this in the air where we're looking at each other, and I say to you, hey, I'm interested in creating this thing, so I just draw some marks in the air. And the fact that I drew those marks on the air means that I've just now modeled this object. And in fact, we can go further than that. Suppose um, we have those invisible robots that we don't have to see, because with augmented reality eventually meeting virtual reality, the robots that are running around making things for us and carrying things around are invisible to us. And it's not spooky, just any more than it's spooky that there's wires and plumbing that we don't choose to look at. So you and I are having a conversation, and I say, hey, I think I want uh, uh, This object, as far as we're concerned, is socially between us, but we can't touch it yet. So we assign a material to it. We go out to lunch. And while we're at lunch, the 3D printer prints it. The robot comes and drops it off. And it's like, oh, it's still there in the same place, but we can, it's developed now, and we can play with it. But it was there socially the moment I made those marks, and that thing showed up. Now, you might say. Well, I like that, but because we share a same language, I think I have another take on this stuff. So you say, um, using a shared language, I'm going to create my own variant of your design. And um, what's going on here behind the scenes, by the way, just for if we want to be nerdy about this, is there is a, a closure that's passing back and forth between these two objects that's giving the recipe for how to apply this spline to this um, object. And the object knows what to do with it. Um, and so you know, we can play all these kinds of games like this. But suppose then I say, I'm looking at this cool thing that you, this cool curve you've made. And I'm saying, ah, you know, we're still in the conversation. Um, I'm not actually interested in using that curve to modify my shape. But I have been working on animating my animated little character that I've been playing around with. And I think you've created a great animation path for my character. So why don't I just take your little thing there and apply it to my character? And then now the character can be flying around and doing different things and we can vary. So notice this is what you do with language. You combine different nouns and different verbs in different ways. Um, now, What's really exciting to me about this is that this means that we can fundamentally change the way we think about our relationship with the world. Like one of the things that's fascinated me since I was a little kid is I've been totally fascinated by the possibility that we could interact with four-dimensional objects. So, you know, of course, the problem is we live in a three-dimensional space. But maybe with objects right there in AR and we can interact with them, we might be able to say, oh, if the object is floating in front of me and I can move my head around it, not only can I model with it, but I might actually 
actually be able to start understanding it and start accepting this hypercube in this case, as I'm sure you all know, as part of my world. Now, I use these techniques now in my teaching at NYU. I teach computer graphics. And there are some concepts that are more difficult than others. For example, um, coordinate systems are actually tricky. I mean, you know, at first you think coordinate systems are two-dimensional things. And eventually, in computer graphics, you realize, well, you really have to deal with the third dimension. And what it really is is it's a way of viewing objects. A coordinate system is a kind of mathematical camera. So if we create some sort of object, we can say, OK, take this object, look at this object through this coordinate system. Now as we make changes to the, to the source object itself, we change this. Maybe we change color. Uh, does that show up there? Yeah, it's good enough. Um, or we do three-dimensional things to it. We can always be looking at that object and viewing it in this mathematical camera. Now, the trickiest thing for my students is trying to explain to them um, these really complicated ideas, like how do I transform this? So of course, most of you here know that the way you transform this is that you come up with an object that does transformation, which of course is a 4x4 four four matrix. And a 4x4 four four matrix has structure. So um, the idea of the lesson is to combine, to relate the structure to what it does. The structure of this is a translation matrix. The structure of this is a rotation matrix. We know it rotates about the x-axis because only y and z are exchanging with each other in a kind of a, I'll make this a little bigger, a kind of a sine and cosine thing. So now, of course, um, if we're in the future and everything we draw comes to life, so instead of AR in action, it's action in AR, I guess, um, we, we then say, oh, great, why don't I just apply actual values to this? And now, because in a visual language, everything that's a noun is also a verb, we can verb this noun. Um, we drop this matrix onto here as a relationship between these two things. And now it's changing this. In fact, of course, we want to do a little Brett Victor thing here. And um, we can change um, the, the range of motion. And now I can start explaining, ah, you see, rotation about the x-axis changes y and z. Rotation about the y-axis only changes changes x and z. And then, of course, we can combine some, some more concepts in here. We could sort of say, oh, well, why don't I introduce other concepts, like fundamental concepts like time, which is uh, an abstraction that we deal with every day. And time is a semantic thing that takes values and turns them into how things change over time. So now it's a rate controller. Um, and then we could say, oh, this is how it would change over the z-axis. Now, I deliberately made the choice over the last three years as I've been developing the software to develop it only in HTML5. So it runs on web browsers. It runs on mobile phones. It runs everywhere. Um, you know, It runs in stereo. You can rotate the view, et cetera. Um, and there's a whole modeling system there that underlying it so you can actually build build entire scenes and walk around. But I'm actually, I mean, I think these things are cool, but I'm specifically interested in these sort of minimal kinds of ways of describing things. Um, now, just to, just to round this off, what my particular interest actually for a long time, for decades, has been um, characters. I love interactive animated characters. Um, I, I'm probably my biggest fanboy moment ever was when Alan Kay introduced me to Randall Monroe, and I got all excited because like it's the XKCD guy. You know what do I do with my hands? And so um, so I started trying to think about what if you could just draw at an XKCD character drops on the table and you can interact with it. You know it comes to life. It's got personality. You know it can do things. It can walk around on your table in the world. Um, and you know and you know it, it, what you do affects it, etc. But then I started thinking, it, why does it even need to be just people? Why don't we actually, why can't we just draw a fanciful creature? And the very fact that we drew this creature means that this creature exists in our world. And that's when I started formulating this idea that the most important thing about these interactive procedural characters, and this is going to become more and more important as AR goes mainstream, is not that we are interested in them. The most important thing about these characters is that they are interested in us. So this bird is incredibly fascinated by my cursor. And he's like looking at it. And the reason that he's fascinated by my cursor, by the way, is that, is that he's very ticklish. And he really, really likes when I do that. And then, of course, eventually, they leave us. And, uh, but we'll meet them again in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>